content warning. This episode includes discussion of drug use and possible violence. Sometimes, a family's worst nightmares come true. Back in August of 2020, 27-year-old Michael Bryson made plans to attend what some describe as a week-long birthday party at a campground in Oregon. On August 5th, while at that party, Michael vanished. Close to three years later, Michael's family still doesn't know what happened to him. We first heard about this case from a guest we've had on the show before, an attorney from the western region of the United States. On today's episode, he will get into the details of this story and explore the possibilities of what may have happened that night in August 2020. On our next episode, we'll speak with Michael's parents. They will share with us a more personal look at what it feels like to suddenly find yourself living in the middle of a public story that is also a deeply personal tragedy. My name is Anya Kane. I'm a journalist. And I'm Kevin Greenlee. I'm an attorney. We first connected while looking into the Burger Chef murders, an Indiana cold case. Together, we built a spreadsheet documenting hundreds of cases of restaurant-related homicides. That original spreadsheet gave way to our podcast, The Murder Sheet. Now we maintain that same research-centric, investigative approach as we look into all sorts of homicides including unsolved cases, historical crimes, and, of course, restaurant murders. We don't just chat about the headlines. Our podcast is a platform for our journalism. The Murder Sheet focuses on investigative reporting, thoughtful analysis, thorough research, and in-depth interviews. We're The Murder Sheet. And this is The Disappearance of Michael Bryson, Part 1. The mystery. We asked our guest to begin by telling us a little about the man at the center of this story. Michael Bryson was a a young man who, by all accounts, was very nice, very well liked in the community. Uh, He comes from a town called Junction City, which is in Oregon. It's, I guess, the best way to describe it would be it's a a suburb of Eugene, Oregon. And uh, Michael Bryson was had a large group of friends. And I I believe it was August 3rd of 2020, which would have been, you know, right in the heart of the first year of the COVID pandemic. He and his friends uh, decided to do a large camping trip, which was sort of a a rave in the woods, something that young people call a renegade, um, sort of like a a rave out in the middle of nowhere. And they decided that they were going to have this party to celebrate one of Michael Bryson's friends birthdays, um, and I believe the day they all went up there was August 3rd, uh, 2020. Just a little background about that area. So they were up in an area called Bryce Creek, which is very, very remote and extremely beautiful, but it, it, it does have some sort of unsavory characters up there. It's somewhere that I have spent some time over the years, um, you know, hiking, fishing, backpacking, relatively familiar with the area and um, the way you would get there is uh, you would head east uh, southeast from from the town of Eugene for about an hour uh, up into the Umpqua National Forest and uh, they were staying uh, they, they had set up camp at a place called Hobo Campground which is at least a half an hour from the last structure that you would see as you're going up in this uh, into this area. So this area is just extremely remote. It's old growth uh, fir and hemlock and spruce forest. Extraordinarily beautiful. Uh, it's one of the areas that, at least thus far, 
has been spared by wildfires. Many of these river canyons have burned in the last 10 or 15 years uh, with wildfires. And this is one of the areas that hasn't. And so it's just a really, really uh, special and, and beautiful area, extremely remote. And the Hobo, Hobo Campground uh, itself is a very small campground. I've been there on one side of it. It, it, it looks like there's probably three campsites on the river side. And, and so there's a, a river side of the campground. Uh, there's a road dividing the campground. And then there's a hillside of the campground. And the way I understand it was the Bryson group uh, had set up their party on the hillside of the campground. And I understand it to have been a, a really um, sort of elaborate camp that they had set up here with a DJ uh, station with, with a, you know, a, a stage for the DJ. They set up a dance area, I understand, and they set up a dome, which they filled with lights and made it sort of like a photo booth. And so people uh, arrived on the 3rd um, of August, and I understand Michael Bryson arrived there sometime that evening, which would have been maybe 8 o'clock on the evening of the 3rd. I, I know that there were problems sort of from the get-go uh, with some of the other people. And I, I think the listeners need to understand about this area is that I think people kind of go up here to disappear for the summer. Um, when you drive up these roads um, anywhere in the Northwest, really, whether it's Oregon or Washington, you see a lot of signs that say no camping longer than 14 days and, you know, so-and-so national forest. But I think it's very hard for law enforcement to enforce that. And I think the result is you get people who are sort of quasi homeless who go up to these areas and just sort of set up a camp uh, for the summer and then maybe move from, from site to site to avoid detection from law enforcement or, or to avoid someone saying they're in violation of this 14 day camping rule. In the, in the summertime, this area, because of that, I think kind of shady people are, are drawn there. There's one particular campsite down from Hobo called Lund that has a history of problems. I know there's a lot of people who, who go there and, and sort of party all night. And there's you would be um, running into a lot of methamphetamine users. I am confident if you went to one of these campgrounds in the summertime particularly in the weekdays, people who are staying there for long periods of time. Um, you'd, you'd run into people who are trying to stay out of the, the uh, eye of law enforcement. And so that's kind of the, the flavor of this area. And I know that the first night they were there, they had an encounter with one of these types of people that I'm talking about. So a lady comes into camp who was just causing all kinds of problems. And I, I think she was having sex on a table with one of the people who was there with with Michael Bryson and, and and they told him to stop and she was super intoxicated. And then I think that at some point in time, there was a physical alter, altercation between this lady and the, the birthday girl, who I believe her name was Josie, the, the person who was, everyone was there for her party, which resulted in Josie just kind of beating this woman up pretty bad, I understand. And then, um, but she didn't leave. So she's, so, so the first night they were there, they were having constant encounters with, other people who were camping nearby who weren't necessarily associated with the, with the group, but were there doing drugs and, and causing problems. I understand that people were kind of showing up uh, throughout the first day, which would have been Monday the third, and the second day. You know, people were kind of going down to. There's really beautiful places to swim down there. People kind of hanging in the swimming holes, doing drugs, partying, as you would, one would expect. And then I, I believe it was the second night that Michael was there. It sounds like he, uh, you know, from what other people have said, he uh, ingested a lot of drugs, which it sounded like a lot of people were doing. If you listen to the interviews of the, of the people who were there, uh, LSD was on the menu, um, Molly, which is street slang for MDMA, or MDA, um, ecstasy, um, those kind of all come under the, the term Molly. Um, ketamine was there, which is a very powerful horse tranquilizer, which young people like to use recreationally. So there, there were a lot of drugs being ingested, and it sounded like a lot of drugs were ingested by Michael Bryson. I don't think anyone disputes that. There was some suggestion that someone had overdosed him on acid, 
on LSD by a term that I wasn't familiar with before I started looking at this case, something called puddling, which uh, I guess is giving someone a huge dose of LSD and uh, seeing how they manage. And I understood that someone had done that uh, to Michael. Um, it's unclear whether it was unwittingly or unknowingly uh, that he ingested it, but I understand that uh, he was had ingested a lot of LSD. And then, you know, kind of depending on who you talk to or whose interview you listen to, some other people came to the party late the second night that Michael Bryson there was there, which I would have believed would have been the night of August 4th, early morning of August 5th of 2020, maybe kind of changed the vibe a bit. There's some suggestion that one of these people was a drug dealer and was owed money by Michael Bryson, although I don't know how well that's been substantiated. There's a suggestion that one of these people or that someone had stolen Michael Bryson's wallet and there was maybe $600 cash in there. Um, I think that was maybe better substantiated, but it didn't sound like Michael Bryson was super upset by that, that he was hand, kind of taking it in stride. But anyhow, these, so these people show up, you know, depending on who you talk to, change the vibe of the party. And then uh, shortly thereafter, Michael Bryson goes missing. There's, there's varying accounts of how he goes missing and, and who saw him last. But if you put everyone's statement together into one timeline, I think probably the best guess is that he walked off. So there were two school buses that were brought up as part of this crew. And it, there was twin girls were, had brought these school buses up and they were kind of the party organizers. It's unclear whether they were like acting as promoters and trying to make money on this or whether they were just doing this for their friend Josie. But the, the two twins report that Michael Bryson uh, walked off the bus at about four o'clock in the morning, the second night he was there. And um, sort of everyone kind of have, has a different account as to what happens after that. A lot of people were super high on drugs and trying to go to sleep. You know, there was music blaring. There had been a complaint from other campers about how loud this group had been. So it was sort of a cha chaotic scene, but shortly after this four o'clock uh, time, it appears that people understood that Michael was missing and began to look for him. I think some people began to look more earnestly than others, kind of based on their intoxication and concern levels. So they looked for him for a while. I think there was initially sort of an assumption that he was going to turn up eventually that maybe he had just wandered off in the woods and laid under a tree and, you know, was, was dozing off or something and he was going to turn up. But as more time went on, he didn't turn up. And I think the concern, uh, rightly so, started to grow for him. I, I believe a group of people had left and had gone back to Eugene several hours after Michael had disappeared. And they originally had said they were going to go in and, and report him missing. Um, but I think what they did, according to reports, was they had uh, kind of went into town to see if anyone had seen him, see if he had kind of made his way back into town and, and was just kind of in town hanging out. But no one had found him. Uh, the way I understand it was these people then came back out to the camp. It's about an hour drive, I would say, from Eugene out to Bryce Creek, the hobo camp. And, and it, one way, it's about an hour I understand these people came back to hobo camp later that afternoon after going to Eugene, realized Michael Bryson was still missing, and then went back into town a second time, at which point in time, law enforcement and Michael Bryson's parents, who immediately came out to the site to start looking for him, were notified. What ensued after that was a absolutely massive manhunt that went on really for months uh, with zero, zero trace initially of Michael Bryson ever being found. They, they did what's called a grid search, you know, where you, where you coordinate off certain areas and you, you put together teams of people and you grid, grid off an area and each team or each person has responsibility for a small portion and then they kind of work their way through this grid, checking off areas with no luck. And this case continued to be... I guess, w without a clue as to his disappearance until I think about December of 2020. The murder sheet keeps us busy. At one recent court hearing, we were running around observing, gathering information and reporting from 5 a.m. to 11 p.m. Because of all that, it's hard to find time to secure quality ingredients and cook fine meals at home. Thankfully, 
HelloFresh has our backs. Our terrific sponsor is America's number one meal kit for a reason. This service combines convenience, value, and deliciousness, and ensures that you and your family are enjoying home-cooked, quality meals without the hassle. Recently, Kevin and I got to put our heads together over something other than script writing. It was so fun to cook together. It was also quite easy. The ingredients are perfectly portioned, so there's no food waste. The instructions are also foolproof, which is lucky for us because we are fools in the kitchen. We prepared beef bulgogi meatballs with roasted carrots, ginger rice, and sriracha sauce. It was delicious. The meatballs were flavorful and the rice was perfectly fluffy. We're pretty used to just grabbing cheap fast food when we're on the road, so some nutritional heft and diversity of cuisine has been really nice. You never have to worry about getting tired of anything because there's something for everyone. Go to HelloFresh.com slash MSheet16 and use code MSheet16 for 16 free meals plus free shipping. Again, go to HelloFresh.com slash MSheet16 and use code MSheet16 for 16 free meals plus free shipping. In December of 2020, now now bear in mind this area is... um, there are both evergreen, and I believe the word for trees that, that lose their leaves is deciduous. Mm-hmm. So there are evergreen and deciduous uh, trees in this area. And the riparian area, which would be the area closest to the water, uh, has a lot of deciduous trees. Alder, right next to the water, and then kind of maple as you're going up. And, and then the forest is primarily uh, evergreen. Like I said before, you're going to have spruce, you're going to have hemlock and, and predominantly fir trees, beautiful old growth firs. That's important for what I'm going to say next, because in December, under a maple tree, uh, which would have lost its leaves probably in, in the couple of weeks before, sort of a small bushy maple tree, they found a bunch of Michael Bryson's clothing. They haven't released what they found, but you know the internet sleuths have suggested that it was his, uh, I believe it was a rainbow pair of Crocs is what I heard, um, and then and some other stuff. So I think there was a suggestion that he was wearing rainbow Crocs when he disappeared. And if you know this, if you, if you went to this area, you would see that it's a very, very rugged area. Crocs would not be a good choice of footwear um, unless you were walking down the road. And so if I could describe the area where his where, where his clothing was found a little better, it was across the creek from the road, and it was down near the creek bed. And it was, if, if you went up the creek from where the clothes were found, it would be super, super steep and bushy for probably three or 400 vertical feet. And then you would get to a trail, a, a well-maintained trail. And so on, on the creek side of, of the road, Across the creek, there is a beautiful trail that attracts lots of hikers and fishermen and people swimming called the Bryce Creek Trail. Down the trail to the creek, it's a super steep, uh, rugged, very forested ravine. At the bottom of this ravine, next to the creek, uh, is where they found Michael Bryson's uh, clothing. It w- there is probably, I would guess, maybe a mile between where this group was camped and where Michael Bryson's clothing was found. There would have been, you know, in my mind, three ways he could have got down there. He could have walked on the road. He could have gotten a ride on the road, if he was even down there. There's there's been no indication how his clothing got there. Some people have suggested, I I, I think, including some people who who have a lot more knowledge about this case than me. Some people have suggested that his clothing was planted there. Um, I don't know what what facts lead them to believe that. I think I think I think the reason people think that was because it would have been they gridded they gridded uh, search this area so tightly that I think the uh, some people think there's no way those clothes could have been there during the grid search. Uh, therefore, someone must have planted them. I think maybe you know because they were under a maple tree, they, they had uh, the, they taped off where all the clothing was and. At one point in time when I was out there, I was able to see that. So I know exactly where they found this stuff. It was under a maple tree. I think, in my mind, it just could have easily been obscured by heavy maple foliage that then disappeared when the leaves came off in the fall. And that's why the clothes weren't found during the grid search. 
but I don't know. I, I didn't. I, w- I didn't participate in the search. I didn't find the clothes. And I, you know, that's that's kind of all I know about them. You know, a, a lot of people do think that they were planted, though, which is interesting to me. Why? Why? If if someone brought about Michael's demise by foul play, why go back and, and plant clothes there? That doesn't make any sense to me five months later. I guess someone could have done that to try to throw law enforcement off their trail. It just doesn't make sense that you would go back um, and dump somebody's, hang on to his clothes and then dump them there four or five months later. So I think the most likely scenario is, is that those clothes were there shortly in time after Michael Bryson disappeared and remained there uh, out of view because they were obscured by foliage until the foliage fell that fall. And then uh, I think it was a hunter who had found them in the, or at the start of the winter, at the end of the fall of 2020. And then there really hasn't been anything that has occurred since then in the case. That's really the last thing that anyone knows or, you know, I don't have any inside knowledge about this case or, or you know, I haven't talked to law enforcement about it. I've, I've been following it very closely. I've, I've listened to a lot of interviews. What are some of the theories about what might have happened? A lot of people have different theories, okay? I I know that uh, some people think that uh, there was foul play at the party. In my mind, that's probably the least likely thing to have happened because there was, you know, depending on who you ask, there was 50 to 100 people there. I'm, I am certain that law enforcement leaned on some of these people um, as part of their investigation. I just, I can't see a murder occurring with that many people and that many people being able to cover it up. I, I don't see that as being a viable thing that it had happened. You know, I, I had mentioned earlier that there was some suggestion that there was bad blood between Michael and, and this guy who showed up shortly before he disappeared. Another theory, it would be that this person somehow separated Michael from the group and was able to uh, cause harm to him and then do that without anyone else knowing. I think that's an unlikely scenario as well. I, I think the two, I, I think the two most likely scenarios of what could have happened there, in my mind, based on you know what I know about the case and and the interviews that I've listened to and what I know about the area. Uh, number one, in, in my mind, I suppose, is that he walked off. And there there is evidence that he walked away from the party that he got upset with the twins and that he left and they started looking for him shortly after. In my mind, I think the most likely scenario is that he walked off somewhere around where his clothing was found. He got clipped by a vehicle, probably an intoxicated driver, and either they moved his body across the street um, and hit him under that tree and then, and then came back and moved the body later and left some clothes and you know did that to essentially cover up the crime of, DUII, assault, DUII, manslaughter, hit and run, that type of thing. I could see that happening out there because of just sort of the wild nature of it. I mean, if you're out there at night, there is absolutely zero law enforcement, right? The closest police station would even be almost an hour away. Like I said, there's, there's, there's partying going on there. There's drug use going on there. I could definitely see people driving up and down that. And so it's a windy, narrow, one lane road at night and and hitting someone and then not wanting to face responsibility uh, from a a criminal liability standpoint for doing that. So in my mind, for whatever that's worth, that's kind of my most likely scenario for what could happen to him. And I think the second most likely scenario is that, and, and I think this scenario is also very, very plausible, but I think as time goes on, it becomes a little bit less plausible you know, as a function of time. And I think that is, that would be that he got high. We, we know that he was high and that he just wandered off, got lost, you know, fell into a tree well, hit his head, you know, fell on a rock, hit his head and was far enough away or in a remote enough area that people haven't found him yet. And, you know, if that's the scenario, then some hunter's going to find him or, or a mushroom picker would find him, you know, maybe a few years down the road. Uh, so know, in my mind, those are the those are the two most likely scenarios. What do you suppose it is about this case that uh, attracts the interest of so many people? You know, that's a great question, Kevin. And I I could never quite put my finger on why people you know are super interested in some of these cases and not other ones. Um, if I had to guess about Michael Bryson's case, 
I, I would say he was just such a likable guy. I never met him personally and I, I, I had never even heard of him and, until probably two or three months after he disappeared. But then I just became fascinated in the story. He just seemed like such a smiley, like nice, likable guy. Like it could be one of my kids. The parents and the family seemed like just real down to earth people, very law abiding, you know, church going type of folk. And just that he, he vanished without a trace in, in the midst of, of so many of his friends. I think it really kind of uh, piqued the interest of, of, of people. And the, I don't know how much you know about the Northwest or about like Northern California, but people disappear all the time from around here. And for a lot of different reasons, I believe, and, and a lot of them, you know, are never solved. But if you go online and you look like starting in, it's mostly west of the Cascades, right? So, uh, so the Northwest is kind of divided by the Cascades. And almost all the people live on the west of the Cascades. The east of the Cascades is kind of high desert. Um, you know, there's a few towns out there. But uh, if you look at the counties on the west of the Cascades, you know, starting somewhere around southern Washington and, and going down, particularly in, the, particularly in the more remote counties of, of southern Oregon and northern California, I'm talking about Josephine County, Douglas County, Jackson County, Humboldt County, Del Norte County, Trinity County. The number of missing people is astronomical. It's, it's almost hard to wrap your mind around how many people are missing in this area. And there's almost a profile to the, the, the type of people who are missing. And I, I would say that Michael fits that profile. It, it's young people. It's Caucasian people. It's people often associated with the drug industry, the drug trade, or, you know, to a lesser extent. And obviously Michael wasn't involved in this, in the, in the, in the sex industry. Uh, but the, but the number of of missing people here it's almost like an epidemic out of, out of, in the northwest and on the west coast, and so I think that uh, you know a lot of these people don't j- generate this type of publicity because maybe they disappeared in the context of, of you know going to work for a grow operation you know in southern Oregon and northern California and were never heard of again. But I think with, with Michael Bryson's case, I, I think what kind of differentiates his case from all these other missing people was that he vanished at a party with all of his you know best friends there, and, and no one seems to know what happened to him. And um, if they do, they're certainly not sharing that with other people. And it's just, he really just vanished in the thin air without, without a trace, like the podcast says. And so I think that when, when something like that happens, I think people understand, hey, you know, this was a super nice kid, a smiley kid, a, a popular social kid. How did this happen? You know, this could happen to anyone. You know, how did this happen? And, and I think that kind of generates a lot of interest in the general public. That's my best guess. Um, and, and I also think that his parents have done an excellent job keeping this case in the public eye. And so I think that's another reason why this case has generated so much publicity. I, I think when cases like the Delphi case or this case remain in the eye of the public, there is a much more uh, high likelihood that they're going to be solved. And so I think that his parents have been on a campaign to keep this thing alive, to keep this thing going with the hopes that someday they'll have answers to what happened to their son. Yeah, well said. Uh, it, it just it continues to encourage law enforcement to keep resources on it and not sort of let it let it slide. Um, and yeah, I think there's something so poignant about an image of a person surrounded by their good friends at a party and then having it end tragically in a way that no one can even account for what exactly happened. It's it's really so. It, it is a fascinating story from that uh, aspect. I, I think I think when it happened, I I sort of remember the news report. Um, but I, I, it seems like this case really generated a lot of, uh, started generating a lot of publicity in the weeks after it happened. And I, I, I do think that was his parents. And, and they brought in a lot of outside private investigators to try to help them out. They had a lot of resources that, that maybe some people don't have to 
to try to, uh, to augment what law enforcement was doing. I know they brought in some private search and rescue teams to, to work the case. Yeah, and there's been a lot of name calling and finger pointing on the on the Facebook page that you're talking about, um, suggesting that some of the people at the party were responsible for Michael's demise. I, you know, I'm going to go back to what I said before. I, I've I've represented so many people charged with crimes, many people charged with crimes in concert with other people. I I am almost certain that if something happened in front of a large number of people, <clears throat> they could not have kept a lid on it for this long. I, I just understand the dynamic of people this age. I understand the dynamic of people suspected or charged with crimes of this age. And I just don't see that as a viable scenario at all. Someone would, someone would talk eventually. It's been what two and a half years now, I think. The, the, the last thing I, I would say about the Bryson case is people need to be careful in this part of the, of the country, particularly when they're out in remote regions. There is a, a criminal element in rural Northwest America that if you come across them in an area like this, you could be in trouble. Um, a lot of these people... Uh, who are in rural Oregon are heavily involved in the drug trade, the drug industry, and in using drugs. And they're also not trying to be found, seen, or exposed by anyone. And so for your viewers who are from that part of the world that are thinking about camping in those areas, I would just advise people to be careful, exercise caution, um, and, and kind of know, know where you are and, and know what the dangers are in this area. They, they, when I started, um, you know, working in some of these more rural counties in the Western United States as an attorney, I was just flabbergasted at the level of criminality that was going on in some of these small towns. And so just as sort of a cautionary uh, tale, you know, some of these areas, although extraordinarily beautiful, um, are very remote and are, are not necessarily safe uh, places to be if you encounter the wrong person or if you're in the wrong place at the wrong time. There are other uh, unsolved homicides in uh, the Michael Bryson area um, at campgrounds. I, there, one that comes to mind was um, – uh, an elderly couple was murdered in a campground not too far from where Michael Bryson uh, and his party was. I want to say this was probably 17 or 18 years ago, and that one still hasn't been solved, and there's no apparent motive and no um, no clues, no motive. Um, just frightening uh, to, to me to, to think that that could happen camping. And there was another case um, very cl also very close to where Michael Bryson uh, was disappearing where – a, a young uh, couple was uh, fishing and camping and perhaps having sex out in, in the woods at a place called Fall Creek, which is pretty close to Bryce Creek. And uh, they were murdered at, at this campground called Broken Bowl in Fall Creek. And, and that case was finally solved uh, through genealogical DNA, but it wasn't solved until, I don't know, 30 years after it happened. And they, the perpetrator was uh, dead by the time they had solved it. So I'm, I'm kind of rambling a little bit here, but um, these are these are beautiful areas that we're talking about, but they're also areas that can be very dangerous. And for those people who are thinking about going into these areas, I would uh, advise them to exercise caution. We would like to thank our guest for sharing the story with us today. As a reminder, our next episode will feature an interview with the parents of Michael Bryson, which will be a much more personal look at this case. In the meantime, if you want to learn more about this case, you can join the Let's Find Michael Bryson group on Facebook. We will include a link to the group in the notes to this and our next episode. Thanks so much for listening to The Murder Sheet. If you have a tip concerning one of the cases we cover, please email us at murdersheet at gmail.com. If you have actionable information about an unsolved crime, please report it to the appropriate authorities. If you're interested in joining our Patreon, 
That's available at www.patreon.com slash murder sheet. If you want to tip us a bit of money for records requests, you can do so at www.buymeacoffee.com slash murder sheet. We very much appreciate any support. Special thanks to Kevin Tyler Greenley, who composed the music for the murder sheet and who you can find on the web at kevintg.com. If you're looking to talk with other listeners about a case we've covered, you can join the Murder Sheet discussion group on Facebook. We mostly focus our time on research and reporting, so we're not on social media much. We do try to check our email account, but we ask for patience as we often receive a lot of messages. Thanks again for listening. Hello, Murder Sheet listeners. Thank you so much for sticking with us until the very end. Just wanted to take a moment as we close out to thank our sponsor, HelloFresh, America's number one meal kit. They are number one for a reason, folks. Kevin and I have been loving the meals we're getting from HelloFresh. We're talking farm fresh produce, protein, all sorts of customizable options to get you exactly what you and your family need. It's very delicious, it's very nutritious. And it's quite affordable. So it ticks off all our boxes. We've been very happy with the service. And, you know, would love for you guys to try it out if you're curious or if you've tried it out in the past and enjoyed it. You know, get that discount. It's HelloFresh.com slash MSheet16. And then you're going to plug in the code MSheet16. You get 16 free meals plus free shipping. You can't beat that. We've really been delighted by it. We work very hard on the podcast. It takes up a lot of time. It's our it's our small business. Um, we really enjoy the work. We enjoy conversing with all of you every week. Um, but at the same time, it's nice for Kevin and I to kind of have something to do outside of office hours. And uh, cooking these meals has been really fun. We're terrible in the kitchen, like disastrous. I mean, like I, I, I can tell you horror stories. You know, I, I mean, I, I probably shouldn't get into it on the podcast, but I mean, some pretty... Some pretty disastrous moments involving our cooking, <laughs> you know, n- nothing, nothing life threatening, but definitely stuff that we we tried to be overly ambitious about, and it either went horribly wrong or it ended up costing like way more than it should have because we didn't properly like think about ingredients and uh, we're not we're not gifted in in the realm of the kitchen, but HelloFresh makes us pretend like we are because everything is so pre-portioned and pre-planned and the instructions are super clear. So like, you're not going to mess it up if you're like us. And if you're, if you're good in the kitchen, then it's just, it's just less of a hassle and and you get everything that you need. You don't have to run out to the grocery store. So super nice. Um, Try it out. I've really enjoyed the meals that they've sent us so far. I can say that Kevin has too. I highlight that because Kevin is pretty picky when it comes to food. He does not he does not like everything. He has he has pretty strong specifications and preferences. Very much cares about things like fresh produce and and farm produce and things like that. So, he's very picky and I think the fact that he is really enjoying HelloFresh is a testament to the quality here because he's a stickler for that kind of thing. Um and so if you are, I think you will enjoy it as well. And again, the uh, URL and promo code that'll get you a sweet discount is HelloFresh.com slash MSheet16. That's M-S-H-E-E-T 16. And use code MSheet16. You're going to get 16 free meals plus free shipping. We hope you enjoy it. And again, thank you so much for listening.